my first knowledge of you was quite negative, I think, of these guys turn up, they think they're trained, they think they're barbers. Um, and some people quite hostile about it. Mm. I'm at odds as to which is right. Do you see what I mean? I just want to set the record straight here and say that I'm not the first person to be running fast track barber courses. What I wanted to do when I set up my academy was to do it better than anyone else. And what does that mean? That means that you have to have integrity in what you do. You have to have a, a method. You have to have understanding of what learners really want. They've shown some commitment because mm -hmm. they've spent some money. Yeah. I mean, what's a 12 week course? It's just shy of 5,000 pounds. You know, so you, you're putting some money down yeah. on an investment on your career. You know, your guys have come out with 12 12 weeks and an intense 12 weeks, but they still need more guidance. They still need more support. Welcome to The Noble Barber. This is a podcast for barbers by barbers, cutting through the crap of the industry. We all want to know how our businesses can run better. I want to talk to people who've done it, messed it up and got it right second time round and can tell us the way that you and I can make our businesses better. Hi, welcome to a new episode of The Noble Barber podcast. I'm here today with Michael Contas. Um, from the London School of Barbering, um, which I've, I've, I've been looking forward to this one, Michael. Your yeah. name comes up a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I hope for good reasons. Yeah, no, in lots. And I say, I mean, I think education is something that has come up a, a lot here. Um, and um, I make an effort to go and talk to lots of different barbershops and I walk into lots and chat. And it tends to be apprentices, training, staff, that kind of stuff. Um, and so London School of Barbering definitely is a name that runs through there. So I'm really pleased you've made it. Thank, thank you, you so Well, much. I just want to say thank you for inviting me on. It's <laughs> a real honour. Excellent. Um, but maybe we should start with how the London School of Barbering appeared. What's your, what's your story? How did, how did you go to get those doors open? Okay, so I'll try to make this brief as right, I can. Mate. So I started in hairdressing and my education was with Sassoon's. Back in 2006, um, I, am a, I was a postgraduate of art. I went to a really good a university, but then as an art student, it's really hard to get into work and uh, earn money. Mm. So I thought, you know, that I need something to kind of fall back on. Uh, my sister was a, is a hairdresser. She, she, she'd worked for a lot of the good salons, the better salons in Knightsbridge, Michael Johns, Neville Daniels. And... Um, at the same time, my cousin, his name is Pedro Enchenko, who's the owner of, um, what's his name, his salon again, but he does Allion Education. Okay. He's based in Covent Garden. He was the principal of the Vidya Sassoon Academy, and he managed to get me on to one of the courses. Right. Seven months later, I think it was, I graduated, went into uh, some salons, worked for a guy called Michael Barnes, session stylist, uh, that was that was all good until I had to leave one day. And then I went to Rush and then I ended up at Hob Salons. Right. With the, the Hob guys, I don't know if you know, yeah. you know them. Lovely guys. And, um, and uh, during my time at Hob, I wasn't really a busy stylist, so to say. I was too indulgent in my work. I never used to make any money for the company. Clive um, used to say that I, <laughs> would die a poor artist. And he's, he was right. And that <laughs> always stayed in my mind. Um, I wasn't making much money as a hairdresser because I wasn't turning them out mm. enough and I wasn't involved in colour. Um, but in the salons, in the Hobbs salons, I was you know training up the apprentices. And uh, I liked it. I was good at articulating what to do, how to do the technique, and you know it resonated really well with the learners. Um, so from there, I decided to get a teaching qualification to do my assessor's award and I gained those. And I, from there, from Hobbs, I went into a, a further education college, you know, uh, teaching hairdressing. Okay. Which is... That seems to be the most hated <laughs> area of our industry at the moment. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a real eye, eye opener for me. So you think that you're going to go in as a teacher, but you end up going in as a as a carer, as a psychologist, mm. and because I was dealing with like a, a, a class uh, of around 20 to 30 girls, 16 to 18 year olds, and that was that was challenging in itself because, mm. you know, I, I, I don't know if you know any 16 year old girls, but in that, that um, time of their lives, their emotions are... are more emotional yeah, than you'd want to be. Wanna yep. be yeah, yeah, I don't want to 
delve too deep into that. But yeah, to skim and pass that. Um, after their photo education college, I went in, I worked for um, a barber academy in central London. I'm not going to mention the name because he is now my competitor. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. And yeah, he, he doesn't like me very much anymore because uh, after we parted ways, I went and set up the London School of Barbering. Mm -hmm. Um, Which was when? What year did that launch? It was, we launched in October 2012. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then we had our first classes in, in January of 2013. So we're getting all set up and ready and okay. first class is in January. In, this, in the same space? No, we, did, we were in Covent Garden, our first, um, right. our first academy, Jury Lane. Oh, okay. On the first floor, Jury Lane. Yeah. We, we, uh, it was, it was... <laughs> It was a bit of a gamble. You don't know what you're doing, sure. you're, you're doing, but you know you you have a vision. Um, you know what what um, made me want to do it in the first place was that I wanted to do it better than anyone else was doing it. You know, um, I just want to set the record straight here and say that I'm not the first person to be running fast track barber courses. Fast track barber courses were around yep. before I even thought of doing them. What I wanted to do when I set up my academy was to do it better than anyone else. And what does that mean? It, 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 what, that means that you have to have integrity in what you do. You have to have a, a method. You have to have understanding of what learners really want. Mm. And over the years, we, I believe that we've kind of fine-tuned it to get that, the, the, the kind of idyllic learning experience for our students. You know, because then they, they're the ones that are paying for it. They're the ones that want to learn a new profession. And we've got to deliver on our promise. Yeah. And, um, you know, now as, as really kind of one of the probably the main suppliers for London barbers at the moment, you know, when we start recruiting, we tend to find um, that's part of a CV. You know, we're probably three camps that we have either have done a paid for course um, have done an apprenticeship, which is uh, have been working elsewhere for a long time, or the new group of the self-taught mm. who have taught themselves from YouTube. Sure. Um, all have their own demands, but as your point of view, if you imagine yourself as a barbershop owner taking one of your graduates on that have done a 12-week course, what happens next? Where do you think a barbershop because I think my react, my first knowledge of you was quite negative. I think of these guys turn up, they think they're trained, they think they're barbers, um, and some people are quite hostile about it. Mm. Um, but I've met, I mean, I met Liam from an earlier podcast, who's the most enthusiastic and the most amazing chap I've met. Sure. So I'm at odds as to which is right. Do you see what I mean? What would I expect if I'm taking on someone who's new to yeah. the industry, I'm interviewing them, they've, a, they've done a 12-week course or a nine-week course yeah. with you, so they've, they've shown some commitment because mm -hmm. they've spent some money. Yeah. I mean, what's a 12-week course in, it's, in pound it, notes? It's just shy of £5,000. You know, so you, you're putting some money down on yeah. an investment on your career. Now, I would know that after a nine, 12-week course, they're not barbershop ready. They're not. Behind, they're not ready to run a full column and and get on. Um, how would you? What would you advise you would give? Would you give me as to how to work with these guys? What they need next? The good thing about our graduates is that they're they're passionate and they're willing to learn. Mm, right. You know, a lot of some barbers that have been in the trade for a long time, they think they know it all. You know, they're hard to mold. They're hard to you know, yep. to embed your DNA into, to get your ethos. The the ones that are fresh off the the learning conveyor belt are the ones that are going to be the most enthusiastic. Mm. They may not be the finished article. They may, but it, given the time and the patience to get them to that level, mm. I'm sure they they would flourish. Again, it is really dependent on the individual. You know, we like uh, we have like let's just say we have a class of nine. We, I expect on average, through my years of teaching, I've kind of identified that you're going to have two shining stars, five that are average and two that are not going to make it. Mm. Yeah, It's the shining stars that you want to be hiring, the ones that have got the natural talent mm. and, then, and the enthusiasm, that have got the personality. Because uh, you know, it's not just about how you cut hair, it's your personality. If you can't attract your clientele by uh, being yourself, then 
You know, you, you, it doesn't matter yeah. how well you can cut hair, <clears throat> you're, you're going to have, you're yeah. going to struggle. I, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, you know, the, the most busiest barbers or hairdressers are not the ones well, that are the best. the best. Yeah, yeah, they're, no, the no, best. they're the ones that have the personality. No. And so, you know, there, 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 there are a lot of naive people coming into barbering education that come to us or any other barbering institute thinking that they can become barbers. I tell you, the reason why they're naive is because they don't, they underestimate the, the difficulty of the mm. job. They underestimate how tough it's going to be, how, you know, how, how well you've got to run that column yeah. to be able to churn out each client, you know, because, you know, whether you're working for yourself or you're working for you, uh, an employee, um, you know, you've got to make money. Yeah. And that's the bottom line, really. You've got to have customer satisfaction and make make someone money. So would you say that you're more of a kind of halfway house that when, rather than me taking on a school leaver and trying to uh, apprentice them through to qualifying, um, I've still got work, I've still got to be involved in training these people up, but you're giving me someone that's yeah. kind of 70% there, 75% yeah, there? I, I would say 70 to 80% there. The reason for it is, is mainly due to the, 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 the abundance of models we're able mm. to provide. Without without those models, we wouldn't have a business. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's that kind of um, that repetition yeah. that allows them to practice. You know, there's lots the kind of, of flying hours. Like, it's you know. the flying exactly yeah. the flying hours. You know, we we put a lot of pressure on our students to cut. Mm. And the biggest complaint I do get from barbers, uh, barbers and barbershop owners, is that the edu the students are not as quick as they'd like them. <laughs> we we want half an hour yeah. cuts. My students cut between 45 minutes to an hour, mm. possibly longer if it's a scissor cut. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I do my utmost to try to get them to cut as fast as they can. Mm. You know, it's when you come and learn with us, you have to understand it's not all like rainbows and sunshines. Yeah. It's, it's pressure. Mm. It's full on. As, as good as my educators are, they also know how to, you know, they, they give a lot of tough love. You know, they, they tell it how it is. And, you know, they'll say to the students, look, if you don't cut fast enough, you don't execute this haircut fast at a reasonable speed, you're not going to make it. So the reality check is there. Yeah. It's not like that we take people's money and say, oh, yeah, that's great. We've got your money now. You can, we'll, 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 we'll just get you trained up at a, a standard that you, you're happy with and let you go. Mm. It's not like that. It's, it, we are really integral to what we, what we believe in. Mm. Okay. And I mean, do you have good relationships with some barbering companies? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. A lot. I, um, uh, I have a lot of people calling me up weekly, daily mm. to, to recruit our graduates. And uh, frustrating as it is to the people that are inquiring, I always push them towards our website where they, um, they, they, they have what we call our jobs portal. Yeah, I've seen it. It's yeah. it, it, where people can post jobs and Oh, um, as soon as that job is posted, all our graduates and whoever signs up to the registers their their name and email address that will get that job listing towards it to Perfect. them. So it's like an Indeed or a Gumtree yeah. for jobs, so so to speak. So you know we don't help our graduates go into get into barb shops directly, even though that I get people asking requested, me yeah, requested. Requested, yeah. but you know um, if they sign up to the jobs portal, they'll they'll get in, they're going to get lots mm. of uh, notifications on. The jobs that are around. And is there a type of barber shop they tend to flourish in? Is there is there is there a kind of a golden route? I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I do hope so because I don't want them going to a five, ten pound barber shop. I would hope they would go to a fifteen and above. Mm. Yeah, and I have um, I have four uh, ex graduates working in ruffians at the moment, wow. and and they're work they they're earning. 50, 60, 70 pound a haircut. Mm. So, and that really makes me happy yeah. that they're earning good money. You know, if they're able to get into the high end barber shop, then that makes me happy. Yeah. Cause you know, that's, that's ultimately what you want mm. for them to be able to. And you're, I mean, um, presumably your students are, have already had one career. Would that be fair to say? Or they're, they're coming yeah. back for something else. I, they've, I, they've drifted or they've, they've not found something that they love. Yeah. It's about 80 to 90% of our demographics. So there are people and who are over 20 and oh, 25. Exactly, between 20 and 30. Oh, okay. Between 20 and 30 that are coming to, uh, to attempt to go into a new profession. Could be their second, third, fourth career. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, and I know we may touch on the colleges and why they shouldn't, uh, why should they come to us first is the college. But imagine you're like 28 years old and you want to get mm. into a new profession. Do you want to go and see our, uh, a college apprentice, a, a college course mm. in an FE college that takes a year to, to complete? And in that time, you're only going to do anywhere between 20, 20, 10 yeah. to 20 haircuts. No, you just, you'd rather fast track it mm. and get as much um, knowledge and skills. And I think and a industry. lot of it, I mean, you tapped on initially, um, you know, the local authority colleges where, um, you know, they, they tend to be younger. They're drifting into it because everyone says you should do that. They're 16, 17, 18. By the time you're 24, 25, 26, and you've had two or three careers, you're, you're presumably more focused. The people you have on your courses have got to be fairly driven people. They've, they've, they've stuck their five grand to one side to, to do it and then have paid. They've got, to, they've got to live for three months without any wages, presumably, yeah. while they're on a call. Yeah, it's so there's on. a commitment that's gone in there. Spot on. And that is the beauty about being a private institute than rather than being government funded mm. is, is that you don't have to deal with the people that don't want to be there. Yeah. The people that are put there to, you know, to essentially put bums on seats so they can get the funding. funding. Yeah, so, yeah. Got, so we have to remember, FE colleges are businesses as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, everyone I've met, and I've met several, they're really interesting people, your students. You yeah, know, the ones, you know, or, yeah, well, yeah. I'm maligning others. There are, yeah. other, there are other colleges and there are other places that people have been from. But I think when you've made that decision at 25, that whatever you've been doing, you're fed up with. You know, Liam said it brilliantly the other week, where he just said, you know what, I'd get up in the morning and I'd feel ill. Mm. And, you know, to the extent that he saw doctors and then when he changed and he starts cutting hair now, he's just like, it's just it was, gone. He was, was affected by depression, yeah. anxiety. Heartbreaking to yeah. listen to someone. And you kind of go, you know, for, to pick yourself up and go, right, this is what I'm going to do. By the time they turn up on your door, they've got to be quite amazing people you're meeting. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, sure. compared to your sure. little period at, no, at, it, at, at local authority. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it is. Yeah. You know, you get people from all walks of life, mm. different characters, international students, and, and, and you know, you never know what you're going to get, but most people are dedicated. They want to learn. They want to mm. be there. And it makes life a lot easier for our educators. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There are a certain... Uh, um, uh, individual cases where you get a disruptive student that doesn't want to be there, that may have had the course oh, paid really? for by their parents. Oh, okay. You know, it, that does happen. But the majority, they, 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 they get by and they fly through and they don't give us any sort of trouble at all. We actually try to make it the most enjoyable, yeah. uh, enjoyable experience. And most of the time, they don't want to leave. Yeah, you know, they, become like that. they become attached to the place. Mm. They, you know, they really, they, they gain new friends. And, uh, yeah, they, everyone goes out for drinks yeah. on a Friday night and, you know, we, they bond. Well, it does seem like they have yeah. this, kind of, this kind of touch of what it's like to be in the workplace. Yeah, it seems like you yeah. do try and run it like it, you know, certainly by the, the, the final few weeks, that it's trying to run more like a barbershop yeah. would. Yeah, well, this, this, this is a, a secret to our success, which, you know, if you're ever trying to start a, a school or an academy or anything, don't, don't treat your models like models. Treat them like clients. Mm. Yeah, so what that means is that give them the five-star service, mm. offering them a drink, make sure that they're gowned up right, make sure they've got a good consultation, make sure their haircut is, has got the educated signature on it and it's, you know, and it's got the, it can go out. It's at the standard that we require. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a lot of returning customers that come to us I was say, weekly. where do your models come from? And was that, I mean, <laughs> I mean now presumably you've got That's a bit of reputation, secret. but, you know, starting <laughs> out in... Uh, in, in the heart of Cotton Garden, trying to get uh, people in for haircuts. So let me tell you, so when I first started uh, in Covent Garden with a class of five, I think it was, and we had I had to get them clients to cut on, I, I would be running the class, but at the same time running down from the first floor where our academy was, onto the street on Jury Lane and literally just, just go, yeah. say, would you like a free haircut? Would you like a free haircut? You know, I've bit up this like thick skin of rejection over the years where I've had so many people say to me, no, no, no. Yeah, no yeah. Like, but every, say, um, every 10th person you ask will say, yeah, okay, sure, I'll free haircut. Yeah, I'll go for that. And that's how you build it up. It was <laughs> just literally just up. grabbing yeah. them off the street. Yeah. And, and do you still work on that principle? It's a free haircut? Um, no, uh, we charge a little bit now. 
We do have uh, some free haircuts. We call them standby slots. Right. So those standby slots are for us to be able to cancel them. I, no, if, if we knew that there are, we had an absent student, cool. they were sick or they couldn't get in, or they had some emergency, yeah. then we have the ability to cancel that client. So that might happen once or twice a week oh, okay. where a student doesn't come in. Because um, we allocate this uh, X amount of models, clients, for that student to cut on that week. Right. So if they're not in on that day, then we have a s surplus of models. And then yeah. our, our waiting area is full. So we have to manage it. Yeah, and over, over the years, we've, we've developed a, a system where we've been able to manage, you know, uh, surplus and, uh, you know, not enough models as well to be able to mm. make sure the students get enough cuts. Because that's the big thing if they're yeah. paying and they're doing yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, there is an awful lot of courses out yeah. there at the moment that are 100% on blocks. And I'm never a quite lot of convinced. The hairdressing that, ones, right? Well, there's quite a few barbering ones okay. that you're clippering mannequin heads. Yeah. Um, which. You know, for a couple of days is fine, but to do twelve weeks of that, you're you're yeah. not gaining. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you can really learn on a mannequin. Yeah, you can. You can get taught the basics, and the, the, tools the, and the, the motions, yeah. just just a little taster. But mm. then it has you, the only way you can learn is on real people. Yeah, and that's the that's the experience mm. for, for our trade. So, what's a haircut cost? Uh, anywhere between three and seven pounds. Okay. So it depends. If you're what a level two, what was the decision to charge for though? What made the? We had so many models that wanted yeah. to come and have haircuts from us, and uh, we did it at a time where kind of business uh, d d declined a little bit. So we just thought that we'd another revenue. Yeah, another revenue stream to to mm. help us balance the books. No, that's cool. To keep our heads above. And how did that go from? Freebies to three yeah, quid, yeah, seven nobody, quid. Nobody really bad an eyelid. No. See, that's the thing. I keep having this conversation all the time. You got to be brave enough about your pricing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, know? you got to. You, you know, if you're, you know, if you don't, if you can't, if if you're not making enough money, you got to put your price up. You got to look at what you're doing and not be afraid to charge for your for your skill. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and with these with these guys coming in, you know. They are. They've they've paid their money. They've they've got a commitment, and by week seven, eight, nine, they've they've earned their skills. You know, even if it is only for a free quid haircut, I think it does put a a yeah. tax on it. Yeah, if you like. they they need to know that this client is paying, paying as well. Yeah. This is what you've got to get used to. Yeah, no, it definitely does you a different mindset. I think. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. So now your problem isn't necessarily models. They line up for you. You get a nice steady stream. You got your customers, so you've got all that. Seems like there's an awful lot of barbers still coming into the industry. So are do you, you think so? Yeah, it does seem yeah. like it. You know, how did you gauge that? How do you, um, how do you gauge that? I think that, it's right? really for the amount of conversations that are coming yeah. up. I think there is an element of, I mean, one of the big things is you're seeing so many barber shops appearing on every single high street. You know, there's certainly a, a, a rebirth of more barber shops, however useful, legitimate, or interesting it, they are. Would you call that a rebirth? Or would you call that like a new phenomenon, having eight barbershops on one high street? Um, well, I think there's always been when you, you know there's always been an element. When I opened my first barbers, we opened it because there was none, there weren't any around, and we opened up our cute little barbershop, and it was really cool. And then within a year, three were within a couple of hundred meters, um, and that's because they saw a big queue outside of ours, and they're like, "Oh, that's." That's that. Now, now I do think there are some streets where it's gone to insane lines where, like you say, you've got eight on a high street. Yeah. That I don't know how they make. Yeah. Have you had a, the Turkish barbershop conversation with any of your hosts yet? Um, well, I've had a conversation with someone re really about, about Turkish bar, real proper Turkish barbers yeah. getting upset with people putting Turkish barber on the front of their signage. Um, so there definitely seems to be no lack of barbers appearing in our on our streets sure so you're getting your presume you're getting trainees turning up yeah of, uh, of course but it, it what it's not like pre-pandemic or pre-brexit you know that's when that was the height that, of, was, that was the height that was the peak mm. i would say yeah we're, we still got many students coming through our doors every three weeks which is our cycle yeah but you know i'm going to be honest and it's not like 
the good old days. No. Before the pandemic, before the cost of living crisis. I mean, prices. as I say, cost of living and pandemic <laughs> and, 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 and Brexit yeah, must we got, has hit everybody. We got shot really hard, yeah. I was going to say, pandemic for you, that was just locked up, shut down. And it, it was locked up, survival. shut down. All the students that were learning at that time had to stop their training. And when we were allowed to reopen again... We had to we had to make sure reaccommodate them yeah. and make sure they finished their education. But at the same time, we had a bottleneck of all this demand. So we had to we, uh, once we saw all those students that were waiting to get onto our courses, then we started to see a little bit of a difference in the in in the in the bookings. Hmm. No problems in the business then. I wouldn't say there is any problems in the business. No, You're quite happy. no, because you know we've like I said, we it's an established business. Mm. Uh, we've got the teaching down, we've got everything down, you know, the, the system, how we teach, the methodology, that is all gravy. Uh, what I, all, I'm i always concerned about as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, is uh, not being left behind. Mm. Being like, always being one step ahead. Innovation. Yeah. Is in, in, you know, and we live in a world where, you know, if you don't, innovate and if you don't progress mm. and you don't and then you're just going to be left behind and your competitors are just going to leave you leave you yep. with scraps so to speak so you know i'm I, you know business may be good but i'm always kind of sh stressing about what to do next i mean and, and from my you know i say i'm always for this and i'm sure it shows i try very hard not to do too much research because i just want to hear your story but um in my head a lot of it has been my experience of lsb has been the you know, from novice to master, which is your 12-week course. Yeah. There are other courses. You do other things there. Yes, we do. We do. We have a variety of courses to uh, suit one's needs. Uh, someone in the industry, say a barber or a hairdresser, we have a two-day skin fade course for, say, a hairdresser that doesn't know how to do a skin fade. We have a three-week MVQ level two course, which can gain your level two in three weeks, but for experienced people only, yeah. not for beginners, people that have been in industry for a year or two. And then okay. we have our MVQ level three course, which is three weeks. Uh, that are, we already have in the beginner course. That's weeks 10, 11, 12. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but we have people in the industry, barbers, that want to open up barber shops. And as far as I'm aware, you need a level three for insurance purposes. Right. So they come and they come and oh, gain their okay. level three. So you do find you've got quite an influx of 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 industry floating around the building at I think time. so yeah as well on top of that we have a lot of MUAs uh, makeup artists that want to come that have a break from their sets or whatever jobs they were doing and they want to come, come and do a, a, a crash course in yeah. a, a, a week's course or a two weeks course and how to cut men's hair yeah and we certainly saw what I found I would say probably about maybe five six years ago there seemed to be a lot of barbers turning up who'd been working as hairdressers um, we got a couple that work for us still um, who were hairdressers who had then made the switch and become barbers. Is that still going on? Are you meeting a lot? A lot of hairdressers. A lot of hairdressers who are kind of fed up with doing the whole gambit and want to and want to brush up on their barbering? We, we, we do for the level three, yes, we do. But I would say those, whoever, if you find those, uh, those individuals, you're a lucky one because mm. they have got a lot of tools under their belt. Yeah. They've got a lot of skills under their belt. You know, I think it's a lot easier to go from hairdressing, hairdressing to barbering than barbering to hairdressing yeah. because there's just so much more involved. Mm. And once you understand how hair is cut and how it, what happens when you cut it, how it falls, I think, you know, you've got that that ground knowledge of how to, how to do barbering as well. Yeah. Because I, 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 what I, you know, come from a hairdressing background, for me, cutting with the scissors is way harder than using the, the yeah. clippers for me. There's certainly more nuance in scissor work. Isn't yeah, there? for sure. I mean, you can, you can teach pretty much most people how to use the, the, the clippers mm. once it, 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 provided they have enough practice or repetition. But, you know, for the scissor works, especially like things like scissor over comb and more advanced layering, I, um, I, I, I think you need a, a years, of, years of experience yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah. And again, I guess it comes back to that, our first point, that, you know, you need your flying hours. That, you know, if you've done 15, you know, if you've been doing five, six years of hairdressing, working in, in, a, in a, a, a lady's salon, doing colour, doing everything, and then you decide you want to switch you've still got that five, six years of flying hours under your belt to sure. adapt in. Sure. Whereas, you know, and that's that's kind of what it all sure. comes down yeah. to. You know, your guys have come out with 12 weeks. 
and an intense 12 weeks, but they still need more guidance. They still need more support. Sure. But what I generally believe it is, the biggest sticking point is the timing. Right. I think, I think it's not the skill itself. I think they know how to cut hair. Mm. And I, I always tell them, you know, when you go and cut next to some, a barber that has been self-taught, or has been taught another way, you will see how good your training is yeah, yeah. when you're when you're at LSB because you know we are very methodical. You know, I, I, you're probably aware of like the Sassoon. Well, I'm Sassoon a Sassoon, I'm Sassoon's trained, so yeah, that it, that very that tight resonates. method of, yeah. of how you cut hair. That's what we wanted to. You know, but that's it takes a while for the kind of fluidity to come in, yeah. which is when you can start doing a, yeah, a thirty minute haircut. Uh, absolutely, I mean, like sometimes you can look at a student. And they'll be, it'll be like watching paint dry mm -hmm. with the way that they're using the clippers. And I'll, I, I will always say to him, look, you can cut hair really well, but you need to look like a barber. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you need to start looking like a yeah. barber. You need to look a bit more fluid in your work and a little bit more like you know what you're yeah, doing. Well, the and, and, and the confidence will, will show through in your, in your body language. Yeah. So for me, it's down to the body language mm. that will give it away or not, whether you're prepared or not. Yeah. And do you find, I mean, I found, like I say, your name tends to get a positive and a negative in, in, in well, in varying degrees. Yeah. Um, and I guess the more I've developed the conversation with them, the biggest bit is that kind of frustration that these guys aren't quite chair ready. Yeah. Do you, do you encounter much of that yourself? Does it come back to you or is this all... I all out of the way from you. Is it, this... it, it used to be a lot it, back in the days where, it, um, where people were bothered about it. Right. Uh, let's, let's say, back in, like, let's say 2017, 2018, that then when we were really established and, we, you know, we were, we were very busy. Were and firing, very popular, yeah. We were firing. Used to hear a lot of, you know, used to hear a lot of noise back then. But nowadays, I don't hear so much noise, to be honest. Well, that's good. And I think that's due to the fact that there's nowhere... We're, we're nowhere else you can mm. learn. I mean, people are not taking apprentices on any moment. I was just saying, that's the big so change, where, where isn't where are you going to learn? You're <clears> going to go to a really, college? It's a really big change. Like I say, yeah. I don't, you know, I ha the majority of people that I meet tend to either come from paid-for courses or, you know, like I say, the new phenomenon of people who are self-taught. Um, which is, you know, like, you know, as we've said with Liam, every now and again you get a shining star and there's exceptions to everything. But copying a... A, a, a YouTube haircut and, and being a fluid barber, I think, uh, yeah. worlds apart. We have a lot of those self-taught barbers come and, come and learn with us. They yeah. do a short course with us. And you know, like, like I said before, with the, with the clippers, they're proficient. Mm. But as soon as you give a them a pair of scissors, scissors mm. yeah, that's where they need work. Yeah. And that's something that does take that discipline of someone showing you and, and you know, yeah, 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 being taught. Yeah, I mean, like mo the, the majority of the haircuts in the academy... Uh, is all is clipper work fades. Um, I wish we could give them more scissor work, mm. you know, because I wish we could get more haircut scissor work wise to get them understanding precision cutting, l layering how hair falls, and yeah. to understand how to cut a, a long haircut because that that will come back around again. Yeah. If mallets came back, then long hair is going to come yeah, back. Yeah. And I mean, so, it definitely. I mean, we have, you know, had a, I've had lots of conversations, and it is amazing that kind of the OA, you know, Noel Gallagher's haircuts back. All the mullets are coming back. Yeah. The the, um, the curtains are coming. You know, back. you said mullets were coming. They came back. <laughs> they, what did they? Were they even in? Were I they, think even they appeared? In? I think they let's appeared. go with it. They appeared. Um, whether they, I don't think they took the world but, by storm in the same way. Anyone cool in a club <laughs> surely wouldn't have a mullet in the I 80s. I think it became very popular with 14, 15 year old kids. I think 14 year old uh, boys oh. suddenly. <laughs> What would you respect? Maybe this is a little bit before my time. <laughs> is, this, is this in the eighties we're talking about? Oh, the mullet was an enormous part of the eighties. Enormous, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, proper party at the front, uh, business yeah. at the front, party yeah, at the back. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think the mullet of today is definitely um, has definitely become more classy by yeah, comparison well, to well, the. It, uh, it's it's infused now with with a fade, yeah, or a taper, mm. and it's probably laid a lot nicer. Oh, it's, a, it's a million miles away from <laughs> from from the um, what was the radio DJ Pat uh, Pat Sharp Pat Sharp Yeah, there you go the ultimate yeah. That was it. Um, but no, I mean, I do think that, that now that we're not seeing people being taken through full apprenticeships, we're not seeing um, 
you know, barber shops training through their own barbers, that yours, you know, yours and schools like yours have to be the future. You know, that's where, like I say, majority of my candidates come through. Um, and it is for us to, you know, I think it is for us to come up with a proper graduate scheme. Sure. Um, now, if you're saying the timing and the scissor work is an issue, timing, that comes, surely. That comes. Yeah, it does it, come it, from it, just it, work. If you give them lots of haircuts and, uh, yeah, if you give them lots of haircuts and you put the pressure on them, uh, they have no choice. Mm. They have no choice. Here you go, you've got, you got you 10 go. haircuts today. Get on with it. Get on with it. Yeah. And then, but the scissor work does need some more mentorship. Yeah. So what we're saying really is, as we're trying to do, and I've certainly not mastered it yet, we've not got there, but we're trying to adapt uh, to having a, a graduate scheme with our barbers, that we have that hinterland between, you know, not quite on the shop floor, still doing more models yeah. and bringing them, bringing them through um, over a shorter period that we're, you know, we're, we're gauging a kind of three-month graduation period sure. that they've done a kind of three month period with with you or one of the one of your competitors sure and then they come to us and do a three month continuation if you like absolutely uh, where they obviously there are salaries and they're and they're and they're nurtured but much more about us mentoring them and trying to create barbers that are like ours that are Laban London barbers I know so, you're the host but can I ask you how many shops you got now two two shops uh, how many chairs you got in those sh shops we've got five five so how frequently do you need to rehire? How, um, how does that, does not, that come around? Not, it's not a big, big issue with us, yeah. to be fair. We do manage to hang on to our people. Um, but I'm a big believer. I've also got a couple of hairdressing salons as well uh, that, that have always had apprentices. Um, and I think training is a big part for us. And I'm looking at a way of bringing that across to our barbershops, which but I haven't to, mastered yet. Trying to bridge in the gap between those... Um, the, I'd like to have homegrown. We'd like to expand into more barbershops and I'd like more of my, I'd like them to be staffed by people who've been through a training with us so that I have real faith yeah. in, in them being more like our signature barbers to right. go on and open up more shops and do other things. Okay. So is it just accepted that barbers will stay loyal for two, three years, one, two, three years, and then move on. Is that the, is that the accepted mm. timeline now? You know, because it is a little bit of a revolving door where you see you have people come in you, that you, you know, they employ, they build up their column, and then they leave for whatever reason. And most of the time, the reason is probably not getting enough pay mm -hmm. or, or, you know, a, a personal reasons like wanting to move or stuff like that, or just getting bored of the Yeah, pace. I mean, I think people do. I mean, our point of view, um, we've recently lost a member of staff who's gone to Oz. Yeah. Um, you know, Australia are doing a great scheme to encourage hairdressers and barbers to go out there. If you're under 30, you get a two-year working visa. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to argue if you fancy doing a bit of travelling. Yeah, I know. Um, so, you know, that's a difficult one. And irritatingly, we haven't done the same scheme backwards in this country. So as an Aussie, you don't get two years to come and work in London, which is annoying. It'd yeah. be nice to have it both ways. Um, my staff, we employ our team um, and we try and keep them as enthused and energised as we can. I think them being included and salaried yeah. um, and waged well is important. So we don't have a lot of movement, but what I'm, you know, we're looking to grow our company. Yeah. And so if we're looking to grow, we need more people. Where I'm going with this is like, you know, if you, uh, how can I explain? If you were, if you were a better employ, employee, if you gave your 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 your, your employ, employees the, the best kind of um, career that mm. they could possibly get, then they're going to stay more low, yeah. and you won't need to rehire as as quickly as often. Yeah, yeah. As often. Yeah, yeah. N n what is your opinion on barber shop owners in general? Do you think that? Uh, the employee, the, the employees are mistreated. Um, I think all in all, all, all industries have good and bad yeah. bosses. Yeah. Um, I, I think I am slightly skewed because most of the people I tend to encounter are really enthused and positive about the industry. Yeah. So I tend to speak to people who are more progressive and are looking for careers. Um, I think there are a lot of stores out there, and it's hairdressers. 
hairdressing salons have always been at blame for this as much as barbers who don't who don't commit to their staff and see them as more of a commodity mm. and then you're always going to get the churn i always think you know chair rental i've got good mates of mine who've got a good chair rental business their guys are there years and years and years and they get encouraged to go elsewhere and they know they've got a good solid business they feel trusted they feel respected and they get on with their day um, equally i know you know i hear the stories of people constantly moving up the road and someone else encouraging them around the corner so i think there's good and bad in everything um i think it's certainly uh i think in barbering there seems to be more crossover that the the the, the, the bad bad barbering companies and the good barbering companies can um get confused about who's right and so the staff will jump between the two sure um and feel they're going to get a great deal over there jump and then realize that's the not the not case greener. um but, you know, I think that's probably the case in most most firms. You know, I certainly think you've got to really put yourself out for your staff now, and too right. You know, yeah. I think I've always had a, a conscience that I want the team to feel it's yeah. their company. And I suppose because there's so many more, so many more barbershops mm. now, you've got more choice. Yeah. Where beforehand, you probably didn't have as many uh, uh, maybe barbershops. It. I mean, I, I, like, I really hope that our ethos is what keeps them, that, you know, yeah. that... that that they really feel, you know, our team feel valued and part of it. Yeah. Um, and um, I think start. I think all team. You should always question where you're working and and if it could be better and if you could if you're just worth more. I think you should always question that. I I like being pushed around by my my team. Yeah. You know, I like it when they push me. Same. Um, I find I have more staff and encourage staff meetings where I come away with a bloody long list of what to do. Sure. Rather than me giving them a bloody long list yeah. and I kind of like that I think yeah. that keeps us that keeps me pushed you know my team are all half my age um, and I like to think I've got twice the experience but I think the kind of combination of the two should lead us to be a really good employee um, but you don't always get it right yeah I wonder whether you know you've got to be a cool barbershop now right because our, our, the image of our, the, the the image of barbering has changed over, yeah. over the years. It's now cool, right? It's 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 a it's a place mm. where you know you get your barbers and they're all dressed up in individual looks, and you know you've got all these stylish haircuts. You know, I I think if you're gonna go into barber barbering, you want to go and work in a, in a in a cool place that kind of maybe reflects your personality. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's kind of um, I think there's room for everyone. Um, I think, you know, our our two stores are the same name. They have huge amounts in common, but have quite a different clientele. Um, so I think with barbers, the big one is to know who your audience is going to be. Because if you're not, you know, the coolest kid on the block, it's going to seem fake if you suddenly start sure. buying a label, you know, cutting your hair, tatting up and trying to be... You know, you're not going to be authentic is a, a word I overuse. You're not going to be authentic. Um, yeah, there are those places, you know, yeah. and I think, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to more and more places that are kind of, you know, gender fluid barbershops are much more about people's identity and how they feel about their identity than whether they're hip and cool. Um, I know an awful lot of guys that come into our shops who are well into their 70s, but they feel young at heart who still want to, come in and be part of the sure. environment. Um, so I think you need to kind of find out, I think if you know who you are as a barber, you should go and look for the shop that reflects you or the shop that you feel you want to aspire to. Yeah. And I think you should always try and be as, la as lame as it sounds. It it's your job to be the best you can be. And you want to find a company that you kind of go, that is going to make me better. Sure. Um, so I think that's probably mine. Man, sure. I'm meant to be asking the questions. Yeah. What are you doing to me? <laughs> I've got to track you over here. <laughs> Buddy, I've wanted to meet you for a very long yeah. time. I really appreciate yeah. your time with us. Um, yeah. Now, I'm just but, intrigued. But, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear the other side of the, well, the I think that's not... See, you know, I, my job is to get people barbershop into barbershop ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbershop ready. So I, I'm, I, I'm going to hold my hands up and say I'm, I'm mm. ignorant. I don't know enough about what's going on mm. in the industry. Well, I've, I've kind of stayed in my lane for these, the, throughout the years and just really focused yeah. on, on, on doing the best job we can. Mm. And we, we, but with that, I haven't been um, in touch with, with the industry itself. 
So it's great to, you know, when I do finally meet some people in the street to ask them, yeah, no, what's going I'm on? Right. I'm, I'm, what's the, what's the, what's the yeah. feeling? What's the vibe yeah. in the industry right now? Are we, are we worried? Are we anxious? You know, are we, are we in a good place at the moment? You know, I, it'd be good, good to get yeah, a feel. I mean, I do think, I mean, I think the barbershop industry, which is hopefully where we're going with our, I think our next three or four guests is very much the crises that are going on. You know, we're, we're talking about the lack of apprentices going in. We're talking about VAT and the costs of, of the VAT registered company, the yeah. employer. We're trying to get that down, right? Um, you know, that's, that, uh, that hopefully will change. Yeah. You know, you're, we've already spoken about the vast amount of barbershops piggybacking other stores. Um, on top of the businesses that are still shutting their doors, either because of the unnecessary competition or from the fallout of COVID. Um, or they're just running a bad, doing, a bad you know, business. Or just, there's always the bits that just ain't doing it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm, we don't try and solve them all here, but we try. No, lovely to hear your yeah. story, mate. Thank, Thank you so you much, so much for, having for me. coming down. It's been a pleasure. Um, I always ask that if the if anyone's viewing who wants to make contact with you, are they okay to email you? Yeah, absolutely. They can contact me on info at londonschoolofbarbering dot com, or if you want to message me personally, you can message me on michael at londonschoolofbarbering dot com. Perfect. We'll stick that on the uh, on the content when when you go up, and. Um, Obviously, I'm always here to respond to any sure. comment. And I would love you to come in to be a guest judge for us. Every three weeks, we have a fade competition right. for our graduates. And uh, it'd be, we always get a great guest judging. Liam's going to be our next judge <laughs> in a couple of weeks' time. So if you've got the time on a Friday, one day, we'd love to come, come in and perhaps you can cherry pick your... Your next... Uh, My, our first graduate. Your first graduate. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Michael, thank you very much. Cheers, You're guys. Welcome. Thank you for watching this episode of The Noble Barber. If you liked it, please do like and subscribe. If you've got comments of what we should be doing in future, please give us your questions and we'll try and find an expert to talk to. Or if you're the expert and you want to come on here and help stay in touch, we'll get you on. Come and join us on the sofa.